Hello, everyone. We're going to go ahead and get started. I want to welcome you all to the Building a Social Media Communications Plan webinar. And my name is Lisa Peterson, and I'm a new media education specialist with the California Pacific Public Health Training Center here at UC Berkeley's School of Public Health. And we're really happy to sponsor this webinar with our Center for Health Leadership as well. And this is our first webinar in our latest 21st Century New Media Training Series, which is called Are We There Yet? New Media Best Practices for Creating and Measuring Impact. And our goal with the series has always been to provide opportunities for health professionals such as yourself to learn how to strategically use new media for public health practice and healthcare. And I'm happy to say that we have some really awesome presenters today that are going to help us learn how to do just that. I'm going to be your moderator today. And before we dive in, I just want to um, offer a couple of reminders. Please be sure to mute your phones by pressing star six. And also, we will be recording um, both the webinar's audio and the chat features. So if, if you don't want to be recorded, um, please be sure to refrain from talking or using the chat feature. So um, today, we're going to be hearing from JC Devera, who's the Communications Manager at the Green Lining Institute, as well as Ray Roca Pickett, who's the Communications Director for the Young Invincibles. A little bit about where we're going today. I'm just going to um, review our session objectives, talk a little bit about some housekeeping for the ReadyTalk webinar platform, and we'll do a poll question, and then we'll launch into JC's uh, presentation. We'll have some time for questions and answers after JC's presentation. Uh, another poll question, and then our second presentation from Ray, and then we'll conclude. And so in terms of our objectives for today, um, I do want to say uh, let me know in the chat box if you can't hear me or any of our speakers, and we'll do our best to troubleshoot that for you. Um, for our objectives today, we really want to be able to um, help everyone understand how to build a strategy for your social media that integrates well with your overall communications plan and help to identify some strategies that will really help you hone in on exactly what your goals, objectives, and the needs of your audience are. And lastly, just identify some essential elements and best practices for a successful social media strategy. And um, another reminder, we'll be live tweeting the event. So we um, invite you to get involved with the hashtag, which I'll have up on the screen and is in the chat box um, to your left. So a few um, participation, housekeeping. Again, be sure to uh, mute your phone line by entering star 6. And you're welcome at any time to send our speakers questions or comments throughout the presentations using your chat box function. And if you want to um, ask a question verbally, we invite you to click the Raise Hand button and that will um, enable us to take you off mute and you can ask a question. And in terms of the questions, we're going to be monitoring both comments and questions throughout the presentations and have time to address them during the uh, question and answer sessions after each of our speakers. And just to let you know, we are going to post um, links to not only the, the um, recording of the session, but the slides and any uh, shared resources that we have. And we will send that out to all participants after the event. So here's our um, hashtag for live tweeting. And I, I hear, with the help of wonderful uh, staff over at the Young Invincibles, um, Julian Aldana and Rihanna King are um, heating up the tweeting uh, for the event. So I encourage you to get involved as well and note this hashtag. And we will be tweeting throughout the event. Before we get started, um, I want to invite you to um, do a poll. We really want to know what your biggest challenge is in building an effective plan, whether that's where to get started or you're already further along and it's really a matter of knowing what your best practices are and honing in on that to make a better impact with what you're doing. So I invite you to go ahead and do the poll. Let's see what's coming in here. 
Um, you can see that we've got um, some folks that it's a matter of having the resources. That's pretty high. It's always, you know, where do you find the time, the staffing, and the funding? Or how do you find those, those essential things that you really should be doing and find what works and get rid of what's not working? Great. So we're going to move forward because we have a um, really busy presentation coming up so and lots to cover. And I want to now introduce our first presenter, J.C. DeVera who is the Communications Manager at the Green Lining Institute. And JC is a Bay Area native who grew up uh, real close by in San Jose. And believing that education would help lift his family out of the working class struggle, JC overcame the obstacles he faced in a violent, under-resourced high school and made it to his dream college, UCLA, where he graduated magna cum laude in 2011 with a BA in Sociology and Asian American Studies. And at UCLA, J.C. developed his passion for community empowerment as a student activist and also as an elected student government official. And J.C. began his greenlining journey with the Academy as a 2011-2012 communications fellow and has arrived today at greenlining as their new media whiz and managing online communications and strategizing online campaigns to expand greenlining's reach and impact. So we are really excited to have him here today, and I'm going to turn it over to JC. Great. Thank you, Lisa, for that introduction. And also thank you to Calpact and to my co-presenter, Ray, from Young Invincibles. I think this is going to be an amazing um, and very useful webinar for you all. Um, so again, good morning to all of my West Coast folks, and to the rest of you all, good afternoon. Again, my name is J.C. DeVere, and I'm the Communications Manager for the Greenlining Institute. Um, we're a public policy think and do tank based in Berkeley, California, and we strive to make the American dream a reality for communities of color by working on several issues from health policy to voting rights to leadership development. We believe deeply in the interconnection of issues and believe that partnerships across all sectors are critical to expanding opportunity. Today I'll be talking to you all about the art of listening, which I've come to believe is the foundation for being successful at social media. So here we go. I wanted to first start off today with the story about greenlining and social media. For many years our organization was using social media without a plan, uh, which is a big no-no. Um, back then we tweeted things and posted things on Facebook thinking that all of the benefits would come immediately. Uh, we were definitely wrong. What we learned is that there needs to be an intentional investment in being good at using these tools. So a little over two years ago, I joined Greenlining as the Communications Fellow, where my main project was to build the foundation for an organizational social media strategy. Our experiences and lessons eventually manifested themselves into a social media toolkit that I authored, which includes tips and best practices for crafting a social media strategy, particularly for nonprofit organizations. Since we have limited time in this presentation, I'll be covering the main points from the toolkit, but if you want the fine details, I encourage you all to download the toolkit from our website, um, and that's greenlining.org. And I think you'll also be receiving a copy of it um, in a follow-up email. So in addition to the tips and best practices, um, it also includes a glossary of common social media jargon, so you can get to, up to speed with your social media vocab, as well as a comprehensive list of clickable online resources to further deepen your understanding and learning of social media. And best of all, it's completely free. All I ask is that once you do use it, um, that you please share it with others and let others know about it. So by the end of my presentation, my hope and goal is that we begin the process of answering three critical questions. First is, what is social media? The second, why should I care about it? And three, how do I start and grow a strategy? So what is social media anyway? Simply put, social media are a collection of communication tools that help inform and connect people. It's social because it all depends on interactions and relationships, much like our offline lives. 
there's no doubt about the impact of social media on our current lives and our current generation. It's become the medium through which most people acquire their news and has increasingly become a great way to stay in contact with friends and family, especially when distance comes into the picture. Social media has become our earphones to listen to what, other, to what matters to other people and a megaphone to amplify what matters to us. But why should we even care about social media? Well, I covered a couple of reasons and benefits in the previous slide, but to add on to that, social media has become a valuable tool to build online communities and relationships. You have the ability to get on people's radars and move them to believe and support the work your organization is doing. Social media have also become useful in achieving different organizational objectives, from fundraising to education to advocacy, you name it. And of course, social media has almost become where you hear breaking news and stories first. If you want to be heard, this is the place to be. However, keep in mind that social media may not be for, your, be for you or your organization. There is a common misconception that we all need to be on social media, but the truth is not all organizations have to be. The fit and alignment will always depend on your organizational goals and capacity, which we will be moving into. Just remember to always keep that in mind. That said, most of you all are probably here to learn more about building or strengthening a social media strategy. So how do we start? A quote that I personally love is, if you fail to plan, you plan to fail. Having a plan is key. That's why the first thing you need to absolutely do is start with a vision. You want to understand your purpose for using social media. Here are a few questions to get you started. One, who's your target audience? Who are you really trying to reach and engage by using social media? Second is, who do we want to, what do we want to accomplish by using social media? Do we want to raise awareness about our issues, fundraise a certain amount of money, educate people about a campaign? You, you really set it for yourself. Um, third, do our goals with social media connect with our or larger organizational objectives? And lastly, how much time and resources can we invest to being successful at social media. Having about three to five sound goals to work towards is a great best practice. Once you've got the vision, you want to choose the right social media tools that will help you achieve it. This is the part where I'm going to be a little partial. When it comes to social media tools, Facebook and Twitter are definitely the ones that you need to be on. Why? Just look at the numbers behind them. There are over 1.15 billion users on Facebook and over 500 million users on Twitter. You can bet you can find a good amount of your target audience in that large sea of users. But in addition to the numbers, Facebook and Twitter also allow you to build your online voice, spread news and information, and engage with your audience directly. Just always be mindful of where your audience is at and what your goals are, because that will inform which tools you should be using. With your, with your tools in place, the next step is to create SMART goals. The SMART acronym stands for Specific, Measurable, Attainable, Relevant, and Time Conscious. You want to incorporate these elements in your goals so that you can benchmark and evaluate your progress throughout time. An example of a SMART goal would be, in one year we want to increase the number of our Facebook fans by 500 through new engagement strategies like sharing asks, photo campaigns, and posing questions in posts. We'll be talking more about measurement and evaluation in our webinar next month, I believe. Now that you know what it takes to get started, how do you grow your social media strategy and online presence? The following slides will give you some tips and best practices for doing just that. First and foremost, you have to listen. You need to know what you're looking for and what messages will resound with people. So the first thing you should do is know your organization in and out. Understand its pulse. When I started out, I met with all of the program directors at Greenlining to learn more about their issues and the work that they're doing. Um, that allowed me to learn more about the buzz topics that they worked on and also who they viewed as big influencers in their field of work. Doing that allowed me to gather a list of buzz terms and influencers to look out for online. I then searched and followed these buzz terms and through Facebook and Twitter to see what exactly people were talking about engage where we could insert our voices into the conversation. 
And it also helps us identify exactly what part of the story did we want to tell about that particular issue. And lastly, being engaged in social media is also a continual learning process. It's always changing, so it's critical to learn and adapt to the latest social media best practices. Follow blogs, sign up for newsletters, do more webinars like this, and just take the time to learn the latest and greatest. To be good at social media, you need to learn how to communicate simply and succinctly. And by now, you may have also learned that using certain tools has a language of its own. So the first step is to learn and familiarize yourself with messaging conventions like hashtags, which is something that Ray will be talking about in her presentation. Keep your messages short, simple, and to the point. Not everybody has the time to read a long essay post. So this is also where you need to define your online voice. What personality or voice do you want your organization to hold? The next door neighbor, the snarky and witty person? Of course, developing your voice will take time. You'll need to test what works well with your audiences and see what they're most receptive to. Lastly, use visuals as much as possible. These are the eye grabbers. Folks love images on their social media feeds, so whenever possible, tell your story through them, whether it's through a photo, a video, or an infographic. Probably the most common question I get from people is, how do you get more followers? What I take this to mean is, how do I build an audience? The first thing I tell them is start with who you know. Who are your frontline supporters? And from there, growth should be organic and create some kind of snowflake effect where your supporters will invite their network, who will invite their networks, and so on. Follow partner organizations and influencers in your work. From there, you'll even discover more organizations and people you may not have heard of before based on their interactions. Another great thing to do is search and monitor conversations through hashtags. For example, if you're looking to see what people are saying about the Affordable Care Act, a great hashtag to search on social media is hashtag, or the pound symbol, ACA. And from there you'll be able to see streams of conversations related to the law and maybe some that are unrelated. And lastly, a good practice is to hashtag your events and campaigns. And we'll use today as an example. So hopefully folks have been using the CalPact NM14 hashtag to tweet your thoughts. Um, and this is just a great way to build community and share different insights and conversations. And when it comes down to it, sharing, engaging, and, and exciting content is king. Content is what attracts people to you online. They want to see that what you're sharing is, uh, is something of value to them. Content is the story and the message that you want folks to know about. To let people know you're serious, it's important to try and maintain consistent activity. Try to be active and post daily. And by being active, that just means you know, sharing someone's tweet or sharing a post that, other, that another organization may have posted. Also, diversify the content that you share. Don't just share article after article. Spice things up with, a pic, with some pictures and videos as well. And to make sure you have a good list of stuff to share, it's also wise to create a flexible weekly post schedule to let you know what kind of content you should be looking for and sharing on particular days. The next two slides will just, will just be some um, pop-outs from our social media toolkit that give you kind of examples about content as well as a flexible post schedule. So here are some content ideas. Um, Obviously, one cool thing to do would be to you know, share a photo, a video, or a quote of the day. And maybe you would also want to do a, a weekly um, ask for new followers and for your support network to help you um, increase your following as well. So that's another thing that you could probably do. And something creative that folks can probably do is you know, run a social media campaign that can co-op mainstream events. So, Right now we have the Olympics going on. Maybe there's a creative way that you can do um, something on social media around giving medals to different organizations or to different people. Um, it really is all up to you, and, it, and this is a time where being creative will definitely play a key role. And here's an example of a flexible post schedule. So, you know, it gives you a good idea of what are the things that you should be looking for each day. For us at Greenlining, we're, we're a multi-issue organization, so 
I try to focus on different issues each, each day of the week so that we can make sure that we produce content and also look for content that's related to the different work that we're doing here at Greenlining. Um, but I mean, other things that folks have been doing in the past, some popular ones, are, for example, are things like Throwback Thursday, which is a really big social media phenomenon um, where, where folks just post pictures from, from their past and kind of just relate that to a lot of the work that they're doing now. Um, and one of the biggest pushbacks against using social media is that there's the idea that it takes way too much time. Well, the good news is that there are tools out there that can help you maximize your time and use it efficiently. Um, for us personally at Greenlining, we use the social media dashboard Hootsuite, which allows you to schedule your posts. It allows you to manage different social media tools all at the same time. Um, we've also been utilizing Twitter lists so that we can do more focused listening. It allows us to look at different conversations and sort users um, based on the different expertise that they have so that we can find relevant content a lot easier and quicker. Um, again, I mentioned that you can schedule posts ahead of time using tools like Hootsuite, which, gives you, which opens up a lot of room for you to do other things throughout the day. Um, and another best practice that I would definitely advise is you know, just set aside a time block um, in your schedule to listen, post, and respond. Um, this doesn't have to be a really long one. It could just be 30 minutes to an hour, but really just dedicating yourself um, to accomplishing different things, whether it's making sure you get a post out um, during that one hour, or whether it's making sure you find some tweets to retweet during that hour. Um, just make sure that you make m the most efficient use of your time um, in a dedicated time block. Um, so here's a snapshot of Hootsuite. It's a little bit small, but I mean a lot of the great things about it is that on the top you have your message composer. This is where, you'll, where you're able to compose your messages, and then from there you'll be able to select which network you want it to be posted to, whether that's Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, you name it. Most of the social media websites are on there. Um, and below that you have what I call are the um, streams or the lists. So these are, that's the most critical part because it allows me to look at different issues and really zone in on um, you know, conversations so that I can find different things um, a lot more easier. So that's Hootsuite. Um, and there's, def there's definitely more detail in the Social Media Toolkit about how you can leverage Hootsuite. So I would definitely advise you all to download it so you can read more of it in detail. Um, and then the last question that I get a lot from folks is, you know, how do we gain buy-in and how do you spread the social media love within your organization, especially if sometimes you have one person doing social media and sometimes that one person is doing 10 other things. So how do you really create like a culture of social media within your organization? Um, and the first thing that I definitely learned as I was trying to do this within Greenlining itself is that it definitely takes a lot of baby steps. Um, you need to show people the value of social media in relation to their work. Um, and from there, there will be, you know, people will start adopting it because then they'll start using the, they'll start viewing the value that it brings to their work and the impact that it can bring as well. Um, for example, um, when I was able to tweet out a lot of different content related to a campaign that one of our um, programs was doing, they were able to see, you know, the tangible impacts of people that we were able to reach, and that allowed them to really be more engaged um, in the process of being on social media. Um, and it allowed them to build relationships with a lot of different people. So they definitely saw that as a tangible gain from being involved in social media. And, not, and beyond that, they were able to get on the, on the radar of a lot of different folks and you know, be seen by a lot of different influencers. So that's something that they definitely wanted to do, um, that they definitely benefited from. Um, the second thing is you know, social media is very technical. Um, there are definitely a lot of things that you need to learn, such as the messaging conventions. So it, you know, it'll definitely take some time to to get to that point to to really familiarize yourself with um, the ins and outs of social media. But once you get develop that knowledge, um, that that gives you an opportunity to spread that knowledge to others within your staff and let them understand. You know, here are the different ways that we can leverage social media. So, um, so doing things like a training, and I've done that before in the past as well. Just 
sat all of our staff members in the room and gave them a social media training um, so that they know how they can use it in their work. Um, the third thing is you know, to develop a social media policy, just having sound guidelines of what, what, um, what are the do's and don'ts of using social media in your organization, um, and being really clear about the different roles and expectations that are placed on different staff members. So from who manages your organizational account to who, what, what, what can people say on their personal accounts. Just really being mindful of that and making sure that you have, you know, that you have the proper processes and protocols in place to um, really do a lot of quality control. And that pretty much wraps up my presentation. But if there are three takeaways that I hope you all took from this presentation is, the first is you can't do social media haphazardly. A smart strategy with clear goals is truly key to being good at it. Um, the second is social media takes a certain level of skill, investment, practice, and risk taking. Uh, I definitely can um, you know, agree with that. It definitely takes a lot of risk. There are going to be some messages that work, some that don't. But the, the most important thing is that you try different things. And third, there's no one-size-fits-all solution um, to being good at social media. Each organization is going to have unique priorities and ways that they want to use it, and they're also going to have different audiences. So the way that you use it is really going to be dependent on those different factors. And lastly, thank you all for your time. Um, if you want more information, about the toolkit, you can find it online on our website, greenlining.org, and then you'll also be getting it in a follow-up email. And if you wanted to contact me directly with any questions that you may have, you can contact me. My um, email is johnd at greenlining.org. And I think that wraps it up. So thank you all for your time, and I hope you all got something good from this. Thanks, JC. That's great. And, um, we are going to take some time for some question and answer. And I know we've gotten some great questions come in the um, chat box. And I'm also going to uh, unmute Ray so she can be online as well. And I think uh, we can start with a question that we got from Andrew early on. I think there was an answer that came in that you might all have seen but might not have seen Andrew's question. He wanted to know, how do you deal with events that happen out of business hours? And also, how much ongoing coordination do you have with your issue leads to stay on top of their issues? I think, JC, you mentioned um, initial conversations. And I know that in reply, Ray had um, uh, talked about uh, HootSuite to help with this issue. Mm -hmm. So um, maybe you're both on, so maybe you both could chime in on that. Sure. Well, I'll answer the question about the after-hour thing, and that's definitely going to be a reality. Um, you know, so for example, a really, um, a really recent example is the State of the Union. Um, a lot of folks were able to, you know, be engaged in that, but that definitely took place outside of work hours. So I think the reality of um, social media is that a lot of the work is going to take place out of the traditional work hours. So that's just something to be mindful of, especially if you want to reach a lot of the different people and insert your voice into those conversations. Because um, you want to be where the action is, and that's going to be live, so you want to be directly in it. Great. Yeah, and, um, and this is Ray. Um, I, I would totally agree with you, JC. Um, you know, uh, with, with communications generally, there are a lot of reactionary pieces, um, but there are some, some dashboards and databases that help um, help plan, um, and obviously um, we can't be all all places at once. And so things like Hootsuite and TweetDeck um, are helpful, so you can pre-schedule tweets or postings, um, and and some of them cross with Facebook. Um, and so you can just set it up to post to Facebook and Twitter during the weekend um, if you have plans or things to do. Um, but obviously, with anything breaking, um, you know, statements and things like that, uh, sometimes those things just need to go out, um, and you can schedule them in advance if you'd like, but sometimes you just have to do it real time. So great advice, JC. And it looks like, Andrew, we had another um, question. Um, interested in knowing how you um, both deal, if you've experienced any kind of pushback or trolling or controversies when you receive um, 
when you're raising issues around racial injustice or systemic racism online, if there's um, any experience you've had and, and what kind of um, actions you've taken in response? Um, well, I can jump into that question. So there's definitely, especially when you're engaging in this kind of work, um, you know, there's always going to be people that are against you. Um, but I think at the end of the day, it's about understanding where they're coming from and also being true and being true to your own message. You know what you you know what story you want to tell. Um, so I think just staying true to that is almost the most important thing, and being sure that you communicate that through all of your messages. And Ray, have have you folks at Young Invincibles had any experience with that? So we haven't um, necessarily had experiences directly relating to racial injustice. Um, we do, you know, as with anything on the internet where you know you don't have to show your face and you don't know people, um, some folks get particularly brave and maybe say things that they wouldn't necessarily say in a town hall setting or something like that. Um, and and honestly, a lot of a lot of what my advice would be is just to, to ignore, ignore, ignore. Um, sometimes when you, when you highlight someone's particular um, aggression towards you, it sort of brings in um, an audience, and so they want to retweet and share it and sort of make it bigger than it really is. Um, and you'll find that with celebrities a lot as well, um, maybe not necessarily dealing with such heavy issues. Um, but the best thing that we have done is really just to continue to, to push harder on pushing out the truth. Um, and so if we get pushed back on something you know, like, like young people and the Affordable Care Act, you know, um, we just continue to say, like, yeah, here are some resources for folks who want to get enrolled. Um, we're really excited about these new numbers. You know, California specifically um, is, is reaching their threshold for young people enrollment, and so that's something that we just are continuing to push out and spread the, the truth about. And so you can sort of use Twitter and Facebook and social media to really be beacons of truth, um, especially in the face of adversity and, and sometimes um, uh, a lack of, of broader knowledge. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. And um, JC, Leah had a question around um, kind of switching over about thinking about audiences for social media and in terms of the sure. optimal audience. When we think about if, if our recipients of our programs are low-income families, we find that many of them aren't using smartphones. And Leah wanted to know, is it worthwhile to use social to create brand awareness and um, maybe drum up donor or volunteer support? even though our programmatic audience isn't using it as much? Huh, that's a good question. Um, I mean, at the end of the day, it's really going to be, you know, what, what exactly do you think you're going to be achieving through using social media? And if you're not going to be able to reach your programmatic audience, then it might not be the best method. But then there are also ways that, you know, social media does come into play where, where it will help you reach your programmatic audience in some way. Maybe it's through a partnership, through you know, an organization that works within the particular communities that you're looking at, and they have a big role and a big presence. So I think a lot of it has to deal with you know, really researching where exactly your audience is and maybe who are, some of the, who are some of the people that you can partner with, and maybe those people are online to, um, to kind of build a connection with. And that could be a reason for using social media um, at the end of the day. And I would, um, I would jump in and, and say that there's actually some new statistics out with the Facebook purchasing of WhatsApp. Um, that's sort of some new news that came out um, this morning and yesterday. Um, but they had shown that you know, Facebook has seen a continued decline in growth, um, especially in younger users. So they have stated you know, that 23% of teens cite Facebook as their most important social network, uh, which is down 33% from six months ago and down 42% from a year before. So there is some, some research going on and, and showing which demographics are using which platforms. And so we do tend to see more of an association with Facebook with older users, um, whereas Snapchat and Instagram um, are, are seeing a, a growth in younger users. So depending on your, um, 
your version of success and what success looks like for you and your organization, reading into those reports and, and figuring out who's doing that research is going to be very helpful for you in building a social media campaign. Um, you know, for, for other folks, you know, especially I run into this a lot with our policy folks, they'll say, oh, we'll just put out some tweets. And we're like, no, you have to know your audience, and we know that if you want us to, you know, if we want to build up email support, you know, we need to look more towards Facebook. And if we want to do more direct action and maybe um, advocacy work, we know that Facebook and Instagram are really how we're going to find those people. Um, so I'm not sure if that's helpful, but I thought I would throw it in there. Yeah, absolutely. And um, Ray, are there? Um, and if you don't know off the top of your head, sorry to pin you down. And JC too, if there are any kind of when when we're talking about that, are there go-to reports that come to mind that um, our audience would would like to know about in relation to that? So I haven't found any specifically. I always just run to my policy team, and I'm like, find me these numbers. <laughs> Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I tend to rely on people who are smarter than me about wonky numbers, um, <laughs> and they tend to direct me towards better places. But you can certainly start with just looking around on Facebook's Facebook page um, and Facebook's website, and they have some statistics and things like that um, for user information. Um, I, I think you can try some of the other rating agencies, um, but I'm not. Nothing pops up to mind um, specifically. I'm not sure, JC, you, you have folks that you use specifically to track that data? Um, to track like demographic data? Um, well, in our social media toolkit actually, we have a lot of resources um, that are clickable, so you can go directly to the web pages that they're at um, that show you kind of like the demographics. Um, and I think another good thing um, when you want to look at who's on social media is to follow a lot of different social media blogs because a lot of um, different organizations do studies you know, based on like, who's on this particular network or who's on the other network. Um, and they compile yearly um, reports to see you know, exactly what are, what's, the, what's the exact makeup of that platform in terms of demographics. So I definitely, I, and I think that I mentioned that earlier, you know, just making sure that you're staying on top of like, the trends and seeing where people are um, and understanding who's um, in which platform. So definitely just check that out. I think you can learn more about that there. That's great. Thanks, JC. And I just will reiterate, um, we, we uh, put it in the chat box, but the wonderful toolkit that JC has mentioned, The Art of Listening, we will provide a link um, in an email that will go out to you with links to the recording, links to the slides, and other resources that we're uh, mentioning. We will add that link to the PDF which is available at greenlining.org as well. So it will be a very wonderful resource. And um, I had a question about um, if you could share, JC, a little bit more about Twitter lists. And also, sure. um, before answering that, I'll just um, do a shout out. When we're talking about some of these things, whether reports or resources, I invite folks, if there are ones that you use that you want to share with our audience, feel free to add it into the chat box, which looks like Robin already did about the Pew Foundation. And what we'll do is we'll um, aggregate those and send them out as a resource uh, list for you as well. So sorry, JC. Back to that no about worries. Twitter list. Um, so Twitter lists. So Twitter lists are things that you can create through the Twitter platform itself. Um, and basically what it allows you to do is create a list where you can sort different folks that you're following um, and put them around like a thematic element. So for example, um, at Greenlining, I've sorted people based on different issue areas that we work on. So I created a list of um, health policy folks so folks that work on health policy or any kind of news that's related to health policy, they all fall under that bucket. So it's a lot easier for me to just search for um, tweets or for content that's related just to health policy. And same thing for all of the other elements. And virtually I think Twitter now, they first had a, like a maximum of 20 lists that you can create, but I think they've expanded that to almost, I don't know, maybe like 200. So you can create a lot of different lists. And basically it just helps you listen a lot better because it helps you listen more intentionally based on things that you're trying to find. Um, and there's, there's definitely tutorials about how to create Twitter lists and what they can be used for. And I've also included that in the toolkit, so you can definitely check that out if you want to learn more about the details. Great. 
thanks, JC and Ray, for right. a really Thank you. good um, Q&A session. I love that. So um, we are going to move on unless you can do really quick an answer. Do you have to create the lists in Twitter, or can you do them in Hootsuite as well? That would be our last question. Sure. So you, so you can do them in both. Um, since Hootsuite pretty much uh, migrates all of the different things that you have on Twitter. Um, and it's actually a lot easier to sort your lists in Hootsuite. So I definitely advise um, doing that. Okay, great. Thank you. Well, I just want to remind everyone, we are live tweeting and the hashtag is here. So go ahead and um, follow that, get, part, get involved, and be part of the conversation. And before we move forward uh, with our presentation from Ray, we just wanted to check in with you all and do another poll. We'd love to learn and get some feedback on what your biggest challenge is in terms of putting your plan into action. So I uh, invite you to go ahead and answer the poll and we'll see where folks are. Looks like so far it's a matter of being strategic. Okay, looks like um, we got a lot of um, folks going in and talking about uh, a challenge in not only matching tools or finding the best practice, but ultimately how to be strategic with it so you do have the impact that you're, you're hoping for. So with that, uh, I think um, Ray's going to have some great um, ways of addressing that question and some of those challenges. So I'd love to now um, Welcome our next presenter. Ray Roca Pickett is the National Communications Director at the Young Invincibles. Ray was raised in Toledo, Ohio, and at an early age understood the impact that unified voices had to affect real systemic change. And after receiving her BA in communications from Ohio Northern University, Ray moved to DC in the hopes of focusing her time and talents on helping others. And previously, uh, she worked promoting national collections of the United States Conference of Catholic Bishops. And she also founded Lone Reform Now, which is an online network of advocates and educators for those burdened by student debt. And Ray's background in media relations and communications, in addition to her advocacy work, helped fuel her passion for working on behalf of millennials. And we're very excited to have you here, Ray. And Awesome. Thank you so much, Lisa. I'm, I'm really excited to be here. Um, well, thanks, JC. Um, that was extremely informative and helpful. Um, I'm, I'm sure a lot of folks on the, um, on the webinar today with us are going to be able to take that information and sort of run with it. And so I, I'm hoping that this portion of the presentation will really give you some, some good examples and case studies as to what Young Invincible has been able to do in order to build a great social media campaign. Um, and so uh, Julian Aldana, who is our Digital Media Coordinator, and Rihanna King, who is our California Communications Coordinator, are tweeting right now. So if you have questions or need links to things, you know, certainly use the hashtag, um, hashtag CalPACNM14, um, and they will be able to, to shoot those over to you as well as you know, using the chat box. Um, so thanks again, everyone. I'm really excited to be here. Um, so let's talk a little bit about Young Invincibles. So we are a national advocacy organization. Uh, we're a nonpartisan nonprofit based out of Washington, D.C. And we work to amplify the voices of young people 18 to 35, specifically in issues relating to health care, uh, jobs and unemployment, and higher education. Um, and so how we do that is through a, a great marriage between uh, policy, so good policy work, putting out white papers and fact sheets and spreading information, being the beacons of truth as I mentioned earlier, um, and also with on the ground organizing, tabling, bus tours, really keeping our fingers on the pulse of what young people need and want, and then translating that into recommendations for policy as well. So it's really cyclical the way that we work. So talking a little bit more um, about being strategic, which I know is one of the concerns that many of you have. Um, we decided that the best way to, to affect change for young people right now would be through healthcare. So we've been really integral in working on healthcare reform and the Affordable Care Act. Um, specifically, uh, with, we started with identifying the problem. And so one of the problems that we found 
um, with a young adults are disproportionately uninsured. So over one in four young adults are uninsured. Um, and so that's what really got our organization interested in, in working on behalf of millennials in this issue. Um, we also found 28% of 18 to 34 year olds are uninsured in the United States. Um, that young adults are insured at higher rates than other groups because of cost and not because of disinterest. We actually found um, in a recent poll that Young Invisibles did, nearly 5% of those folks that we polled didn't have health care because they didn't want it. It was because they didn't have access to affordable care either through their jobs um, or their parents or something else. And so one of the things that we've been really excited about with the Affordable Care Act is that young people can be insured through their parents' plans up to the age of 26. Um, another thing that we found is that health care is unaffordable for young adults without employer-based coverage. That has been true especially before 2014. Um, and that uh, you know, there's also a need for younger, healthier people to be in the insurance pool. Uh, our stance has always been that we just want young people to get insured, but also it's great for everyone when young people are insured. So when we were talking about how to be strategic about how to build this into a social media campaign, this is sort of a wonky, crazy issue. You know, we know that young people don't necessarily know about insurance. Um, they don't know what deductibles or premiums are. And so we were like, how do we fit this into you know, 140 characters or less? Um, so we decided to really push on open enrollment. So we identified the problem, which was that young people needed health care, and then we decided that the way, the vehicle to reach young people um, was through open enrollment. So really getting involved with identifying partners before October of 2013, um, executing a plan between October and December, and then assessing success at the end of 2014. So that's kind of the plan that we took, um, and that's what we're in the middle of now. So what that means is before October of 2013, we started brainstorming and committing. We were trying to capitalize on trends in pop culture. So when we're talking about sports, we're talking about March Madness, the Super Bowl, we're talking about movies, we're talking about the Hunger Games. All of these different pieces had, you know, were able to resonate with especially young audiences. Um, and so that really helped us to, to continue to carry our message over um, through them. So we also, um, you know, we were talking about trending hashtags you can use in a new and clever way. So um, one of the campaigns we did before this one was, can you hear me now? Um, and so we would hashtag, can you hear me now? We need jobs for young people. Or can you hear me now? We need health care now. Um, you know, and things like that. So the, the downside, you know, as with, with most things with trial and error, was that that hashtag would also get sort of hijacked by Verizon people. So people would post, you know, can you hear me now? My Verizon bill is out of control. And so we are like, uh, maybe we need a new hashtag. Speaking of hashtags, if you're tweeting along with us, it's hashtag CalPACNM14, um, and Julian and Rihanna are working on that. I uh, just wanted to give them another shout out. Um, so we also keep in mind resources and budget. So when I started at Young Invincibles almost two years ago, um, I was the only full-time communications person on staff. Now we have such a huge, awesome team. Um, so we have myself, Julian, Rihanna's in California, uh, and then we also have our digital media manager. We also have a national communications manager who deals with mostly traditional media, and then we also have a great intern. Um, and so we are really building and expanding, but we had a long time where we had a lot to do with little resources. Um, and so a lot of that was you know, using things for free. Um, Facebook, Twitter, not using ads, um, you know, trying to figure out Photoshop and things like that, creating memes, sharing memes, but really working with great partners who were already doing something that was awesome and we could just share with our users as well to sort of get that um, viewership and audience rate up. So um, that, that's when it comes to what are our partners looking for, what content are partners willing to share and help with. So rather than just reinventing the wheel, um, we worked with folks who were already doing a great job with social media, and we asked them, you know, how can we help? How can we share this information? Hey, can you guys make an infographic for us? We want to convey these facts. Um, and so we were able to get this up and running uh, you know, on our own. Um, so what our game plan was, we decided mm -hmm. to really push over um, 
get the Get Covered campaign through football. So we wanted to capitalize on trends in pop culture by um, you know, linking this to the beginning of football season. Seasons, football players get beat up a lot. Um, you know, there's a lot of healthcare issues relating to sports and sporting events. And a lot of people were using Twitter and Facebook to talk about sporting events, um, especially football. Um, and so we decided to, to really capitalize on that and use those resources to get to our key audience members who were talking about something unrelated to healthcare. Um, we also um, were really on a very, very tight budget. So all of the people that you see right now are Young Invisible staff. So um, uh, let's see. I believe mm -hmm. this is Julian right there. Uh, <laughs> this is Catherine, our operations manager. Uh, this is Tristan. He's actually a DC navigator. Uh, and this is Jess. She's our social media manager. Mm -hmm. So we just got everyone together and we're like, hey guys, uh, can you dress up like football players and pose for these pictures? And they were like, uh, I guess so. Uh, it took a little bit of convincing, uh, but they did and they looked great. And so we were able to create some other memes with their images. Um, there is Julian. Hi, Julian. Um, who's usually stuck behind Twitter and Facebook. Um, he's down here as well. We knew that we needed to access, um, or I'm sorry, we needed to identify um, folks who were uninsured who also spoke Spanish. Um, we know that um, Spanish-speaking folks were disproportionately uninsured. Um, and so we created not only an English social media campaign, but a Spanish one as well. Um, especially in key states like Virginia, Arizona, Texas, um, and in California as well. Um, so that's, that's sort of what we made on a very tight budget. Uh, we went to a park that was just by our office and spent a couple of hours um, blowing off some steam, throwing around football, and then we also made this really cool campaign with these really great graphics. Um, we knew that the challenge was really going to come between October and December when we, were, we needed to keep the engagement up. So we had this great opportunity to capitalize on football and sports, but we knew that people weren't going to be talking about that forever. And so we needed to use a variety of tools in order to continue to keep them engaged. Um, this goes back to what J, uh, JC was talking about, knowing your audience. We knew that we needed young people, and so maybe Facebook wasn't the best place to, um, to get in touch with them. So what we decided to do was use a combination of Twitter, using Twitter chats, photos, sending out reports and fact sheets that way as well. So it was a combination of fun, cool um, engagement, and then also some sort of wonky policy stuff that we needed to get across as well. Um, we also wanted to use Instagram to show sort of behind the scenes, hey, you know, we're people too. You know, we, um, you know, this is how this campaign is going. These are the people that we're talking to. Here are people who are getting enrolled and are really excited about it. And so we wanted to share their stories. Um, and so we used Instagram to sort of do that. Facebook we used to promote events, partner events, um, send out press releases, um, send out really cool interviews that our staff was doing, um, and also to share photos from events. So we used photo albums for that. Um, and then with Tumblr, we used our graphics, our memes, photos, music, videos, things like that. So we sort of used a combination in order to really make this campaign much more successful. Um, so with Twitter, we did a help, help for all Twitter chat. Um, we did that with um, at Cal Immigrant, at Moms Rising, and at NILC. Um, and I believe we did this in English and Spanish, but Julian I'm sure will correct me in the chat box down there. Um, we, in order to prepare for this, we collaborated with partners, created scripted Q&As, and designated who will ask and answer each question. So a Twitter chat seems like it's kind of organic, um, and it starts out of nothing, but really it takes a lot of preparing and a lot of work behind it. Um, we used Hootsuite and, um, I'm sorry, we used TweetDeck here um, a lot to set up some pre-scheduled um, tweets. And then we could use our staff time to answer questions in real time for folks. So that's how we maximized our staff capacity in that sense. Um, and then in order to promote the chat, we sent out the hashtag to everybody on our email list. We also asked all of our staff members to send, send it out to all of their partners. We created a, a really simple form email, um, and we're able to just send this out to, to our folks and use our, our entire staff. Um, policy managers, our operations folks, 
and just said, hey, send this to everyone you've ever met in your entire life and have them join. Um, and so it was really successful. It was really great. We were able to get a lot of information out. Um, and we were also able to direct folks who really needed help, who needed to access coverage to the places that they needed to go, which is definitely our ultimate goal. Um, and so that's what we did. Um, another example of a great live tweeting event was we live tweeted the State of the Union event. We, um, our communication staff was actually invited to the White House um, for a special um, State of the Union viewing sort of, it wasn't really a party, but it seemed like a party because it was all of us and all of these great social media and communications people who were also paying attention to the same issues. And so how we did this was we divided amongst our staff who would get pieces of the speech when it came out, um, divided it up by issue area. So Julian and Rihanna and Jess and myself and Colin and our whole team divided it. We just sort of went and conquered. We created tweets around our issue areas. So um, one staff person would look for education um, points that the president was going to discuss and then create those, I'm sorry, those tweets to go out. Um, ahead of time so that we can, again, maximize our staff capacity to answer questions and send photos and really react to real-time things that were happening. So really those, those dashboards like TweetDeck and Hootsuite are very important. The benefit of those also, um, by the way, is that you can get great analytics about your audience base by using those um, dashboards and other things similar to that. Um, and so we were able to tweet policy. Um, that were sort of wonky with also things that we knew our audience was really going to be interested in. Um, and then we were able to capitalize on the trending hashtag um, SOTU um, and we're able to reach much more pe many more people than we would have otherwise. So. Um, speaking of hashtags, um, what's really important is to research important hashtags for your work. I mentioned some trial and error using our old hashtag which was can you hear me now? Um, and so sometimes it's going to work and sometimes it's not. Um, and it really just takes some flexibility and being able to say, um, you know, this seems like a great idea in theory, but actually we should switch to this hashtag instead so that we can monitor it better and, and really send it out. Um, and so we are able to also use um, hashtags on Facebook, Instagram, and Tumblr. They all use hashtags. Um, Facebook, they didn't really take off as well, but I still use them. And you can still click on other hashtags to see what other folks are talking about. Um, so it's still really cool and it's still a great way to get a lot of information in one sort of false swoop, um, and that's why they're so important. Um, I would say with Facebook, I mentioned earlier that Facebook has seen a decline in growth, especially amongst younger users. Um, so teenagers especially are using Facebook less and less. They're using things like Snapchat and Instagram a lot more. Um, and they're even using Twitter a little bit less. Um, Twitter is still very popular and very cool. Um, but so one of the things that we found on Facebook was that paid advertising with promoted posts, boosted posts, and ads are going to be more effective because you're getting to older users and you also might be you know, reaching outside of your audience base. Another issue with um, Facebook is that they change their algorithm so frequently so that once you think you've got it all figured out and you know, you know what you need to get out there, sometimes it changes. And so with Facebook, really putting your money into it is what's going to probably get the best um, impact for you, and that's what we have found. So that's what we use Facebook for a lot of. Um, we also discovered um, through trial and error as well that um, Facebook um, I'm sorry, Facebook ads change their grid. So that's important to know as well. If you're using you know, a meme or you want to use an image, you can only use 20% of that image as text in order for Facebook to boost it or turn it into sort of an ad that reaches more people. So you're no longer, if you have 15,000 followers on Facebook or, or likes on Facebook, you're not actually reaching them with every post that you create. That's why these paid posts are, are really going to help you maximize your impact. Um, and so the numbers again for that, I think Allison might have just asked, um, was that 23% of teens cite Facebook as the mo most important social network, um, which is down 33% from six months ago and down 42% from a year ago. So I just wanted to throw that out there again. 
um, Instagram. So we've got a great um, photo here uh, as an example of how we use Instagram. We're we're really we don't have that many folks following us on Instagram right now. So the things that we use it for is really to just connect and show more behind the scenes things. Um, this was a day when I believe Gmail went down a couple of weeks ago for everyone. Um, we use Gmail a lot, so they had a little cookie break um, in our digital um, closet um, that we like to use to get our work done. Um, and so Instagram is just for photos, but like I mentioned, you can also use hashtags with Instagram as well. Um, a lot of businesses are starting to use Instagram, um, especially you know clothing stores and things like that. But it's really great for for healthcare, especially because you know if you're doing a, a blood drive or you're giving out flu shots, you can make pictures of those um, and put them out on Instagram and, and get people to come to those events. Um, so that's re a really cool way to use it as well. Um, when in doubt, jump on memes. A meme is an element of culture or system of behavior that may be considered to be passed from one individual to another by non-kinetic memes, especially imitation. So we use a lot of um, we use a lot of cat memes um, and we, a lot of Ryan Gosling memes. Um, these are things that are just fun and sort of silly. Um, you can get memes on BuzzFeed, Reddit, your Facebook feed. And the great thing is um, some of our memes that we have actually made ourselves have been featured on these other places. So memes don't really necessarily mean this only stays on Facebook or only stays on Twitter. They can get picked up by other news outlets, and those can get you some media and press attention as well. So they, you know, they're fun and cool, but they definitely take a little bit of strategy as well. Um, and if your organizations are like mine, where sometimes you're taking really wonky policy language and you really need to break it down, especially if you're going to put it on Facebook, you need to cut it down to less than 20% of your text. So that sometimes is a challenge. Um, so it's just really good to know um, that it does take some strategy, um, and making a meme for the sake of making a meme isn't necessarily the best thing to do. Um, unless it's going to be really cool um, and you're going to be able to really maximize it through ads and boosting. Um, unfortunately, getting memes to go viral um, is not as easy as it used to be because everything is kind of oversaturated. Um, so that's just something to keep in mind as well. Um, here's a, another example of some good memes and bad memes. So last week um, here on the East Coast, um, there were a couple of maps going around. So the good meme is actually uh, will show you in wine bottles how much snow you're going to get. So the yellow is like, oh, you only need one bottle of wine to survive the storm. Um, and then you can see the last one there is a three bottle of wine kind of snowstorm that's going to hit you. Um, then under the bad memes, it actually was posted by the National Weather Service in Baltimore. And as you can see, it's really confusing. You don't know what the colors mean. There's a lot of wonky language in here like NAM, GFS, EMOWS that you wouldn't necessarily know if you're just you know, Susie and Joe on Facebook. Um, and so we thought this was a really cool example to put in of something that just happened and that happens all the time. So creating memes for the sake of making memes isn't necessarily a great use of your time unless you're really able to keep it simple and keep it shareable. That's the most important thing. Um, and then when we're talking about organizing, social media is digital organizing. So our folks on the ground, when they go out to do presentations about the Affordable Care Act, or um, if we're talking about jobs for young people, we give our organizers a little tutorial. So I train them how to speak to um, traditional media outlets and do a regular media prep session with them. But we also show them how to take videos, um, how to take, um, how to do an interview with folks on the ground who they speak with. Um, we also encourage them to take lots and lots of photos and videos so that we can take them back here and cut them down and edit them and share them in a way that's really going to impact our audience well. So you're also promoting their events through hashtags and following partners and things like that. Um, but then you're also you know, sharing your event and you're, you're getting content to share with your users as well. So, um, so yeah, so organizing is definitely a great way to use social media as well. Um, and then we just, um, to give you a little bit of a case study, we just finished National Youth Enrollment Day, which was last weekend. Um, we partnered with organizations across the country like the American Cancer Society and Enroll America um, and United Way Worldwide. And we organized hundreds of events across the country on the ground 
that were specifically enrolling folks in healthcare and getting them the information that they needed. Um, we had, if you go to our Facebook page, um, Young Invincibles, or you follow us on Twitter at yi underscore care, you'll see that we made several um, Valentine's Day related um, memes and cards, e-cards to share with people using celebrities and kind of quirky, funny language. Um, and that was actually picked up on Bill Maher's show Friday before National Youth Enrollment Day. Um, he kind of focused on it then, which was fine with us because our um, you know our email address, or I'm sorry, our website address and all of our social stuff was still on it. So social is fun, and so it can because things are fun. Sometimes they're taken less seriously, but really, social media should be considered just an extension of your existing communications plan. It's just as important as doing an interview on CNN. Um, and sometimes you're reaching more people through social media than you would be on CNN anyways. Um, and so that's why it's really important to be strategic and it's important to know your audience just as you would in any other form of communication. So with that, um, I will open it up back to Lisa um, and offer up um, any answers for questions. That's great, Ray. Um, just awesome presentations from both you and um, JC. There's such a, a wealth of um, great tips and strategies on those slides that I know for sure I'm going to be pouring over those to see what I can use myself, and I'm sure others will be. And in relation to that, just a reminder, we will be sending out links to the recording, the slides, and resources shared uh, after the event. And um, I think I wanted to ask you a question about um, a little bit about, you know, I think this is in our poll, but a, ma a matter of resources. And you both have mentioned that you started from a, a team of one um, to a larger team. And I'm just wondering, Ray, if you can, um, with your uh, your own journey at Young Invincibles, if you could share a little bit more about that. Any tips, lessons learned? Definitely, yes. Um, so it's it's funny. Um, I <laughs> I talk to my team all the time about how busy we are and how crazy it is. Um, and I just did a presentation a couple of weeks ago with um, some campus presidents from Catholic universities here at Georgetown um, with an organization called NCLC. And we were talking. And um, after the presentation, you know, the the executive director of that organization came up to me and said, you know, I'm really trying to hire a policy person, but I think I just need a communications person first. And I was like, you have no idea how amazing that is. No organization will openly admit that they need a communications person almost more than they need a policy person. And to hear that is, is like music to my ears. Communications is so important. It's really the vehicle to getting all of your important work and your information out to your audience. It's great for funders. It's great for advocacy work. You know, we we frequently will send clips um, from media events throughout the week to funders, um, to potential funders. Um, we also send them, you know, to our um, our friends on the hill, and they also circulate them to their offices. So, um, and a lot of those are including hashtags and memes, and we're getting retweeted by congressmen and things like that. And so, it's easy, free advocacy work. It takes a lot of time, but I think for for a lot of people, especially myself, building the case for communications is sometimes hard in small nonprofits where you've only you have a small staff of people, you have limited resources, um, you have limited funding, and so really working very hard on the front end to make the case that, yeah, I can do this. I can send these tweets. I can make these memes. I can you know, place these, these pieces here. But if we had just a little bit more, look at what I could do with this. I could go to this conference. I could you know, um, learn more about how to work on our website internally so we don't have to have someone off-site working on that. You know, things like that. Uh, knowing where you want to be is almost more important than where you actually are right now. Because then you can be able to make the case um, to build and grow. And, and that's something that we've definitely experienced here. And, um, and I'm sure a lot of you experience the same thing in small organizations. Yes, and, and JC, did you have any comment on that? Yeah, sure. Um, so our experience at Greenlining is definitely the same as those at Young Invincibles. Um, we started out, we didn't have a communications department first and foremost. And then 
Um, and then we had a communications director, and he was kind of, you know, playing like five hats at one time, doing social media, not really knowing how to do it, um, doing video work, so a whole bunch of different things. Um, so I definitely agree with what Ray was sharing about, you know, really building the case for communications on the front end, because I think we just need to have your, you know, having upper management, having the board really understand that communications is a critical tool in order to achieve greater organizational impact. Um, and I think that's what that's kind of like the story that we that we that we weaved here at Greenlining is to show the incremental gains that we've got because of the, of our engagement in communication. So after our director, um, you know, we started investing in getting someone for traditional media. We were able to see big gains there, seeing more of our name out there. And then after that, they were like, okay, well, we need to build onto social media because that's almost like the next step. Um, so then after making that initial investment, um, then we were able to see incremental gains there as well, um, you know, being able to see different partnerships that sprout, sprout up, um, being, able to, being able to be seen as um, like an influencer or kind of like an expert in different issues, all because of like the attention that we were getting through all of our different mediums. So I, I definitely agree, you know, you have to build the case, but building the case will definitely um, force you to, you know, really show what, what's the impact that you get from different things. Um, so definitely look into a lot of different, like, case studies and a lot of, you know, share a lot of stories from other organizations that have been able to make it work. I would just add one more thing. Um, analytics are also very important. They're very intimidating sounding. Um, if you are a more of a wordsy person like I am and not more of a math person, um, the idea of staring at more and more spreadsheets is sort of intimidating and exhausting in and of itself. But they're very important, um, especially if you're working with policy folks. Numbers and stats go a really long way in making the case. So you can be able, you know, as an admin on your Facebook page, to say like, oh, well today this post reached 459 people. That's the number of people who saw my page's post. And then you can say, okay, and then the reach is X amount of people who saw this page because we put some money into it. So you can really be able to show them like, okay, we can reach 200 people, but we could reach 4,000 people if we put 75 bucks behind this post on Facebook. Um, those, those sorts of easy numbers, I mean, you can get that from just logging in as an admin on your Facebook page. So those things are also really important, and I would really stress the importance of learning more about how to pull analytics um, for social and, and even for your website. Great. And, and thinking about um, making the case, I'm wondering if you both could address the idea of, uh, you know, we've, we've talked earlier about matching. Um, what you're doing with your objectives and goals and mission of your organization. And I'm wondering a little bit if you could talk, you know, one of the main ones is honing in on the audience. And I'm just curious if you could share a little bit about how you determined where and how best to reach them, and if that changed over time, if there were lessons learned, or any um, strategies that were particularly helpful. I'm sorry, I think you might have broke up a little bit. What was that question? Um, it was really about honing in on our audience and thinking about how to determine best where they're at and the best channel to reach them. If you could share a little bit about how you've done that and I think getting to helping to um, ensure that, that matches what you're doing is matching your goals and objectives uh, for the organization. Definitely. So I always like to work backwards. Um, and so for us, um, with healthcare specifically, success is, is you know, 100% of uninsured young people get insurance, and so we're like, okay, but how does that? How do we? How do we determine that? How, what does that look like? Well, we know that young people are using Twitter and Instagram and mobile devices, so we want to make sure that our website that is talking about healthcare is mobile friendly. Um, we want to make sure that we're reaching constituent specific bases, so we know that. Um, young African American males use Twitter more than, than everybody else on Twitter. And so we're like, okay, if we want to reach this demographic of people, we need to be on Twitter more, especially in these peak hours. Um, I, I think it was someone in the chat box posted that Pew actually does a lot of research on social. So you really just need to figure out where you're going to get your research from, and then figure out which audience and constituency base you want to reach. Figure out who's reaching them and talk to them. 
So and, you know, one of the challenges that we're, we have found is that we really needed to, um, since we, our goal is to amplify the voices of all young people, we need to make sure that we're amplifying the voices of young LGBT folks, um, African Americans, um, Latinos, um, folks who are undocumented, and things like that. And so we really wanted to reach out to organizations who are doing that well and working really on the ground on behalf of those folks and see how we could help them. Um, so rather than us saying like, okay, we're going to take this and we're going to do this, we're like, hey, we have resources for you. We have this great fact sheet on LGBT um, young people and the ACA. What, can you share this? Can you push this out for us? Um, and so they're tweeting it and putting it on, our, on their website and our website and creating all these hubs. And so, you know, like I said, social media doesn't mean you have to reinvent the wheel. It just means you kind of have to shine it a little more often. Um, and, and so that's one of the things that we do, um, for sure. Great. Thanks. And JC, I know in the, the toolkit um, there's probably really good um, resource on uh, determining SMART objectives, right? That would be helpful with that as well? Yes. There's definitely a whole section on it and also kind of like a formula that you can follow that will help you create SMART objectives a lot more um, easily. Great. And I know that we, in speaking about um, uh, reaching and connecting with our diverse audiences, I know somebody had mentioned something about were you able to do the uh, health for all and uh, tweet chat in both English and Spanish. Maybe you yes. both could um, talk a little bit about how, um, how you're able to reach a diverse audience there through social. Yes, that is definitely something we knew was important was to do um, a Twitter chat that was bilingual and something that we had never done before because we never had staff capacity. So we would tap into folks on our staff who knew how to speak Spanish um, and who knew how to speak Spanish in a healthcare setting. Um, and we invited them, you know, Kate, can you help us? You know, can you give us, you know, some sample tweets to put out? Um, can you be on for 20, 30 minutes just to answer questions for folks in Spanish? Um, and that's how we were able to do it. And now we're getting to the point where that's becoming more institutionalized, um, and we're able to have more press releases and fact sheets translated. Um, we're hoping to, you know, hopefully in the next year or so, have our entire website be in English and Spanish. We know it's something that is, is desperately needed, um, and, 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 and we're working on that. And so not everything is going to be a giant leap, um, but I think that the, the bilingual Twitter chat and how well received it was and how much great feedback we got from that was able to really help us as communications professionals manage up um, and, and try to request funding and things like that for specifically doing things in more in Spanish in multiple languages. Um, so in that specific example, yes. We knew that that was something we needed to do, and we were able to, to figure out how best to do that. And partnering with groups who are able to tweet in Spanish was really helpful as well. Great. Thanks, Ray. And we have a question from Isha, if I'm saying the name correctly. Isha, you can uh, ask your question by unmuting your phone um, by doing star 7. Are you there, Isha? Let's see if I can help here. Oh, I think she, um, Isha you go. says Are you that there, she Isha? only... Uh, I unmuted you if you have a question for us. Oh, to internet only. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to. Looks like uh, the question was when it comes to social media, what kinds of obstacles have been communicated as it relates to government agencies? That's a great question. Um, we have certainly run into that in Invincibles with um, some glitches with healthcare.gov. You might have heard about them. Um, so those were challenging, and what we did um, was we just worked with our traditional comms team and digital team um, to really get more resources out there for um, young people to uh, enroll in healthcare by phone and paper applications, doing in-person meetings, um, and really answering questions specifically. So maybe folks weren't actually enrolling, but they were still being educated about the process and about healthcare in general. 
Um, like I mentioned earlier, a lot of young people specifically don't know about um, healthcare, how to use it. Um, they don't know about premiums. They don't know about deductibles. And so even though the website specifically was down, we were still able to get out the information that we knew young people needed to receive. Um, and using social media was a great way to do that. Um, so I, I hope that answers your question. Um, but if not, please let me know. And um, just to go back a little bit, we had a question, Ray, about um, what do you mean by um, institutionalizing multilingual communications efforts, such as hiring sure. staff that are bilingual communication experts or consultants? Um, it's, it's that, but it's also about um, building cultural competencies throughout departments. Um, and so in an effort to, to genuinely reach out to a, a constituent base that we, we know needs the information that we have to share, we just need you know, as a communication team to continue to make sure that our policy folks are pushing out um, pieces that are helpful for young uh, Latinos and African Americans. So one of those ways that I, I would call it institutionalizing because it, it really, I want to, you know, and we as an organization want to really ingrain um, making things bilingual, for instance, in all of the work that we do. So one of those ways is by taking something that we do all the time and making it, um, making it a little bit different and sort of tweaking it. So one of those instances is every month when the jobs numbers come out, um, we Young Invisibles does a statement on youth jobs. Um, and so one of those pieces is that we've really been highlighting youth jobs overall, but also how young Latinos and young African Americans are faring in the economy as well. Um, and so it's not just about people you know, speaking Spanish or not, but it's really about making sure that our policies are reflective of all young people. One of those ways, yes, is by providing content that is in both languages. But another way is also to make sure that our policies and the other, you know, our organizing efforts are also reflecting those changes as well. Great, thank you. And we have a question for Mary Ellen because we do have folks that are really kind of at the beginning of establishing their social media plan. And um, I'm curious if you can suggest a place to start or um, additional resources that come to mind. And we can also add these later. But uh, for both JC and Ray, if there's you know recommendation in terms of okay, we're just getting started, what would you do? What's most important? I think um, JC had a really good point about establishing a schedule. Um, you know, he JC, you had a really cool chart about fun things to do and and sort of breaking things up. Like maybe one day you have something from your executive director. Maybe you're posting something on Throwback Thursday. Um, you know, things like that. I think that's a great place to start because getting in the habit of doing it um, is sometimes the hardest part because you don't have time. You're doing, you're juggling so many other tasks. So my advice would be to establish a schedule where you're posting, you know, twice a week, and then maybe three times a week, and then maybe every day, and then maybe twice a day. Um, and the twice a day could come in eight months. Um, and you just have to sort of build up to it. I don't, I don't know if JC, you had something, um, something else. Yeah. Um, I mean, I think for those that are just starting out on social media, it's, it's a lot of learning at the beginning. I definitely didn't start like as a pro at social media. I didn't really understand too much at the beginning about how it's used in an organizational setting. Um, but I, I, I like committed myself to just reading a lot more, like doing webinars like this, um, doing, like reading a lot of different online articles as well. Um, there's a lot of good resources that I put in the social media toolkit. There's a lot of great blog suggestions. Um, there's ones that, spe that focus specifically on like not social, media's, social media nonprofits. Um, so definitely check those out. Um, they're all links in there so you can, you can you know, have a field day and just start reading and learning about different ways to use social media for your organization. Great, and I think um, maybe we'll do um, one last question. I think you know, beginning or in the middle, or if you've been doing this and you feel like you're, you're, you're nearing rock star status, but you'd really uh, like like to um, get even better, is this idea of branding 
and um, being consistent and impactful across channels. And I know the idea of branding for um, a lot of us is kind of a, a might not be as um, accessible in terms of really understanding how to get a handle on that for our work. Maybe you can speak to the importance of that or what's worked for you. Uh, well, I can jump in on that one. Um, that's something that I actually um, you know, grapple with a lot of times um, when I'm doing my social media messaging. But at the end of the day, it's about you know, branding to me is defining like what voice do you wanna do you wanna hold and that you wanna kind of project when you're out there online. Um, you know, do you wanna have this strong voice about you know being an advocate? So I think it really is reflective of you know where your organization is at and what are your overall objectives. Like for us, we're we're a policy organization and an advocacy organization. So we do a lot of you know work in Sacramento and um, and on the Hill to push forward a lot of different bills. So you know, a lot of that also incorporates us really being hard on you know, different um, politicians and having people understand what's the importance of it. So really raising like, a sense of urgency through our um, different posts. But at the same time, you know, we also want to let people know that we're, we're definitely very compassionate and really understanding of different things. So I think it really depends on you know, different situations and stuff and what your, what your campaigns and what your overall goals and objectives for your campaigns will be. Great. Thanks, JC. Anything to add in closing, Ray? No, I think JC nailed it um, for sure. Um, I mean, I, I think um, I think the most important thing is to realize that social media can um, can be sort of a double-edged sword in, in terms of selling it to the rest of your your staff and the people you work with. Um, you know, some people think, oh, it's super easy. You just send some tweets, and some people you know, are so scared of it that they don't want to touch it with a 10-foot pole. And so um, if you want to make it happen, um, there are resources available to you and ways to get started. But um, I, I would just you know, start following folks who are doing social media really well. Um, start you know, retweeting people if you, you don't really know how to tweet. Um, if you're not sure how to use Instagram, make a personal account for yourself. Um, then you know, share pictures of your family members. You know, follow bloggers that you like. You know, I follow a lot of fashion bloggers on Instagram. Um, you know, uh, food bloggers, things like that. So think of things that are interesting to you in order to sort of get your feet wet in social media generally. Um, and, and don't be scared. You know, um, there's a lot of great things that can come out of social media. Um, and so I would just encourage you to find the the vehicle that works best for you and your organization and your message that you want to get across, and you know, figure out what you like about it and what you don't like about it, and um, and, and see how you can use it to work for you. Great. Well, thank you so much, um, JC and Ray. Excellent presentations, and I wish I had some kind of special sound effect so you could hear the the sound of many hands clapping, but. Uh, Thank you so much. That's great. So I want to just wrap it up here. Um, so many thanks to our speakers. And if you want to get in contact with them, the information is here. And um, with our links, we'll also invite you to follow both the Green Lining and the Young Invincibles. And a huge shout out um, of those clapping hands as well to Julian and Rihanna for some really awesome uh, tweeting. And thanks for managing that for us. And um, just want to mention that after the webinar, we will have a post survey. We're always really interested in learning more about what worked, what didn't work, what you're looking for so that we can improve what we're doing. We'll also be sending out a survey um, to check in with you all to see who might be interested in sharing what they think they could do in the next month. One small step to further your goals in relation to building a social media communications plan that's really effective. And um, we just appreciate your feedback overall. And uh, you know, invite you. We have part two coming up on March 13th with uh, Ray and JC, and we're going to be talking about the next step, social measurement and evaluation. And that's on March 13th. We still have. Um, I was going to say seats, but that's kind of that doesn't work this way. <laughs> we have spots online, so please be sure to visit the the page for the event and um, register and take a look at what else we have coming up in the session. 
and I just want to thank you all. Have a wonderful rest of the day, and um, rock those social media communications plan. Thanks again. Take care, everybody. Thank you. Please stand by.